Thou who at thy first Eucharist didst pray that all thy church might be forever one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From the words of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, 386. Since Christ himself has declared the bread to be his body, who can have any further doubt? Since he himself has said quite categorically, this is my blood, who would dare to question it and say that it is not his blood? Therefore, it is with complete assurance that we receive the bread and wine as the body and blood of Christ. His body is given to us under the symbol of bread, and his blood is given to us under the symbol of wine in order to make us, by receiving them, one body and blood with him. Having his body and blood in our members, we become bearers of Christ and sharers. As St. Peter says of the divine nature, do not then regard the Eucharistic elements as ordinary bread and wine. They are, in fact, the body and blood of the Lord, as he himself has declared. Whatever your senses tell you, be strong in faith. I remember years ago, Joe and the children and I were living in Pennsylvania. We were preparing for our annual vacation. And the local United Methodist minister decided to come by and ask a few questions about some matters that were still hanging regarding some particular type of work we were doing in the community. And I said, look, I'm packing, but come on in while I pack. As I was packing, he said, what's that? And I said, well, that's called a chasuble. And he said, well, what's that? I said, well, that's, you know, that's the maniple. And on and on, I was packing, and he said, wait a minute, I thought you were going on vacation. I didn't know you were going away on, on a business trip. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, we are going on vacation, but I'll be celebrating Mass wherever we decide to stop, so I need to have everything with me. He said, you mean to tell me that when you go away on vacation, you pack bread, wine, chalice, patent, all of these things you're telling me, you take those with you. And I said, yeah, that's what I do. I said, you know, if there's a first class feast this week, I'll be celebrating that mess too. Pause for a moment and he said, hmm, guess I'd have to pack a sermon. I mean, it is amazing when you stop and think about it. Aren't you glad that he gave us the Last Supper instead of the Last Sermon? <laughs> Imagine what heaven would be like with nonstop sermonizing. The Eucharist is a foretaste of heaven. The reason we celebrate the way we do is because we are not here to entertain the people. I find it quite extraordinary today that everywhere I go, if I am silly enough to give my email address, I receive something by email asking me how I enjoyed my stop. How did you enjoy the hotel? How did you enjoy your meal? On and on it goes. And this kind of commercialism, which I certainly understand in one sense, because it's an attempt to see what the consumer needs and see if we can prove what the consumer wants, unfortunately, has been adopted by churches. I mean, I'm expecting this any time. You know, you visit a church, and you get a questionnaire in the mail. Did you like the selection of wine that we used for Mass? Did it have an interesting bouquet? Was the music to your liking? You were sitting in the non-smoking section of our church when the incense came. Was there enough there for the people who wanted incense, but not too much for those who didn't want it? And on and on this silliness would go as if somehow our opinion matters. It's extraordinary, isn't it, not to go into sad and unfortunate situations, but how some churches think they can, all, they can vote on somebody that's something that has already been determined by God. Isn't that amazing? How 
We can have the audacity to think that we can change something that God already said. It's an exercise in futility to our own damnation. Because our job is to act upon the words of God. Jesus desires to be worshipped. The Eucharist is not, let me entertain you. The Eucharist is God-directed. The task of the priest is to represent Christ at the altar. That's why we stand so forward and firm in faith, because the priest is representing Jesus Christ at the altar in relationship with Holy Mother Church. A complementary view between the bride and the bridegroom. It's so clear, but why not? Because Jesus said it. Just as we have just heard so very, very clearly from sincere old Jerusalem, you don't have to ask the question. If Jesus said it, it is. It is. He says, this is my body, this is my blood, it is. He says that we are the bride of Christ, we are. He says that he is the bridegroom, he is. He's not a bride. And the church is not a bridegroom. We believe it because he said it. But, but, and here's where that tricky part comes in. We have 2,000 years to show us that his words are true. Not 2,000 years to vote on whether we agree with it or not, but 2,000 years to enjoy it. I mean, what a, what a gloomy life it must be to think that we have to go back and review everything that God has ordained. Apart from the fact that it's arrogant, it's a waste of time. If we have to constantly define and redefine certain matters of faith, that means we haven't spent enough time proclaiming it. We haven't spent enough time telling others about it. I can remember as a child looking very carefully at the manuals of the Confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament and looking at all of the goals and putting my finger in all of them. Yes, 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 yes. Reservation of the Blessed Sacrament, yes. A candle wherever the Blessed Sacrament is, yes. Appropriate reception, oh yes. On and on, looking at all the goals. And I, I remember fantasizing as a teenager what it would be like if all of our churches had tabernacles and candles, benediction, adoration, and celebrated the Mass more than they did morning prayer. So I guess we can say we have total triumph today. I mean, there are tabernacles everywhere, candles everywhere. I see copes and miters being worn in places where magpies were normative. Here's a triumph. Or is it? Or is it? Is it possible that occasionally people have gotten so caught up in the externals that they forget about Jesus? Is it so possible that we've spent so much time trying to vote on and define and redefine and figure out that we have forgotten who we're talking about? Is it possible that we have spent so much time to, trying to figure out who I am that we forget who He is? Is it possible that we spend more time concerned about who I am instead of whose I am. Is it possible that we have spent more time designing monstrances than focusing on the one who is in the monstrance? Is it possible? Well, in rereading much of the great work of James DeCoven and rereading some of Bishop Grafton's works, I continue to be blessed by their insights, realizing that a general convention in the Episcopal Church, 
at one time meant arguing about ornaments at the altar, about how Jesus should be reverenced at the altar, and what exactly we meant by Eucharistic presence. Again, we go back to the church fathers. They had no doubt. They had no questions. And yet, beloved, and yet, the Eucharist is being celebrated regularly. It's being reserved in many places. But here's what I'm witnessing more and more. Let's have a few drinks. Let's have a big meal, and let's go celebrate the Eucharist. No preparation. Why should we have preparation? It's a party. When I go to parties, I grab a few hors d'oeuvres here and there, the ones I like. I walk up and down the line. I get my drinks. I get what I need when I want it. I'm a happy man. I'm a happy woman. And yet if we look very, very carefully at the teachings of Holy Mother Church, what she teaches us is a proper respect and preparation for receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I proclaim this for Ford and Faith as the year of the Eucharist. I ask that all of you a year ago focus more fully on the whole nature of what we mean by the Eucharist, what we mean by Eucharistic presence, and what we mean by being the body of Jesus Christ. But I've been saving this thought so that we might be able to work this through in our own minds about appropriate preparation. I have found in the course of my going around the church that there are many people who want to speak in defense of the sacrament of penance. It's just that they never make their confessions. They want to tell us how important the seven sacraments are, but they don't want to use them. How in the world can a priest hear a confession if he doesn't make his own confession? How in the world can a person be cleansed of their sins by occasionally looking out of the corner of their eyes with a grin saying the burden of them is intolerable? There's a great deal more to receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ than just showing up at the altar. There's a great deal more about receiving the body and blood of Christ than coming strutting in in the middle of the Mass and just assume that Jesus has been waiting for us and is quite delighted we finally made our appearance. Our life is to be such a life of humility that we know we are not worthy. One of the moves of the liturgical renewal in the 60s was to make it clear that there are certain elements of Eucharistic piety that need to be gone. One of them is our unworthiness, because, of course, people would point out, we are quite worthy. Really, good to know. In effect, it took a psychiatrist to ask a rather important question. Whatever became of sin? Whatever became of sin? And if it seems to be absolutely absurd to you, I want you to ponder with me today. Those things today that we treat as individual expressions that allow people to see who I really am, who years ago we simply called a sin. It's sort of the West Side Story phenomenon, isn't it? Summarized in that song, Officer Krupke. Do you remember? I mean, these juvenile delinquents are out here getting in all kind of trouble, but finally they hook up with a social worker. And the social worker goes to Officer Krupke and pleads their case and said, they didn't do anything wrong, they're just a victim of their circumstances. You see? So no sin. They're a victim of their circumstances. They can't help it there the way they are. And for sinners, that's a nice way out, isn't it? Yeah, as we walk around singing our favorite hymn, How Great I Art. You and I, well, I'll speak for myself, are sinners in need of being saved. And if we don't believe that we need to be saved, then, beloved in Christ, we think, therefore, and conclude that we do not need a Savior. 
And if there is no sin, then there doesn't need to be anybody around to wash away our sins. And if we are going to work through all of these things anyway, through a process that leads to self-actualization, then we don't need a confessional. In fact, why don't we just take them out and put in a Freudian couch in exchange so that everybody can say how they feel? Do you feel sorry for your sins? I do. When I think of people whom I've offended, when I think of things that I've done or things that I've said, we must be moved to penitence. And the reason for that is because of the fact that we must be cleansed and ready to receive the precious and pure body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now note, I could go on forever talking with you about why I believe in the real presence. But there's no point talking about the real presence if we're not willing to be cleansed so that we can receive him. Therefore, in the midst of our preparation, I have made some observations. One of my favorites is as I drive down streets and I see a sign that says, Confessions by Appointment. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Hey there, Father, this is Fred. Just wanted you to know I'd like to make an appointment because I'm a miserable sinner. Think about that for just a moment. That's not exactly, as they say today, user-friendly. I think it would be far better for every priest to be sitting somewhere on a Saturday morning ready to hear confessions and nobody shows up than it is for him not to do that, not to be there. Everybody needs to know that the priest is available to hear confessions and that we need to make our confession. I regularly am asked what the purpose of Forward in Faith is. Sometimes it comes out of that marvelous 21st century axiom which goes like this. I know what you did for me before, but what have you done for me today? When we needed the vote, yes, Forward in Faith was there. Well, folks, that was your grandfather's Forward in Faith. Today, you are understanding the current Forward in Faith that has gone from organization to organism to teach the Catholic faith, to teach the faith that has been delivered to the saints, to make it clear that it's not just a matter of whether you genuflect or bow profoundly at exactly what you do with your fingers when you go to get the Blessed Sacrament. It's what you do with your heart. It's what you do with your heart. And are you ready for your Lord and your Savior to take up residence in you? Because that's what he wants. To put it a little differently, you and I become little tabernacles. Places, receptacles, where Jesus wishes to take up residence. And I can't imagine that if Jesus came knocking at the door of our houses and that we would say, my house is a mess, but hey, you got to take what you get. This is me. I do it like, like I do it. No changes here. Now, if Jesus comes knocking at your door, what do you do? Not only do you give him all of you, but you make room for him. And when you and I are filled with resentments and angers and hostilities, there's no room for Jesus because we have already determined that we would rather have within us angers and hostilities, resentments, slights. I have really become tired of figuring out what side I'm on. You know, somebody says, what side are you on? I've been asked that question all my life. It's, it's crazy. You and I are on the side of Jesus. You and I are on the side of the Catholic faith. Let other people worry about how it all filters out. But you and I have something to offer that nobody else can offer. And that is the historic faith without alteration, without abridgment, 
that we offer humbly because we are not about entertaining the people. We are about having a foretaste of heaven where we may be with Jesus. The last part of that wonderful hymn with which I opened, Lord, who at thy first Eucharist didst pray, has at the end something that has put some sacramentalist into craziness. Because it says, when sacraments shall cease. Now think about that for a moment. There will be a day when sacraments will cease. Some of you feel as if you've been there, but I mean, as it relates to the necessity of sacraments in heaven, no need. You will be in the presence of Christ at all times, worshiping holy, holy, holy. And that's why we worship the way we do. It's because if we're not familiar with heaven in advance, we will feel like strangers. And so in this world, the best we can do is have a foretaste so that in the world to come, we may be with Jesus. Because in the end, he is the only one who will unite his people. No votes, no plans, no resolutions. Lord, who at thy first Eucharist didst pray that all thy church might be forever one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.